Buenas noches, good afternoon. Buenas noches, bienvenidos. I know that guy. He was one of my professors. <laughs> okay. We are live and we're going to get started. So welcome subcommittee, body worn camera subcommittee. Great to see you here. Thanks for taking time out of your evening to participate in this important process. Uh, I'd like to welcome subcommittee members, of course, and also we have two guests uh, whom you've seen before. We have City Prosecutor Travis Smith and Eugene Police Lieutenant uh, Angie San Miguel. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, I've got some kind of opening remarks <clears throat> that I wanna read into the record, kind of informational things. And, um, and then we can get started with the business at hand tonight, which is talking about body-worn cameras. Um, so this is the first of uh, possible two meetings for this subcommitting, uh, body-worn cameras, and the model that has proven to be successful in this ad hoc process has been where the subcommittee meets for the first time and they have an opportunity to bounce ideas and ask questions with the content experts tonight. That's Travis Smith and Lieutenant Sam Miguel. Uh, and kind of, you know, explore possible uh, recommendations and possible motions that you would want to bring to the larger ad hoc committee. And then there's usually a second subcommittee meeting at which time the subcommittee members can uh, really put the finishing touches <clears throat> on any motions that they wanna bring to the larger ad hoc committee. So that's kind of the model that we're following tonight. And um, I'm looking at my notes and um, it looks like if this subcommittee did have recommendations <clears throat> to bring to the larger ad hoc committee, that that would happen on March 2nd. So that kind of gives you an idea about the timeline. Um, the ad hoc committee meeting, as you remember, on January 5th was dedicated to the topic of body worn cameras. And the uh, content experts provided some pre recorded presentations, and they also were available for questions and answers. And so, just as a recap, um, we had Lieutenant Sam Miguel uh, with a pre recorded presentation, we had uh, City Prosecutor Travis Smith with a pre-recorded uh, presentation. We had um, Deputy Police Auditor Leah Pitcher with a pre-recorded presentation. And uh, finally, we had uh, Captain Klinko uh, from EPD with a presentation. And so uh, I've, I've included that information in the information packet that I sent out this morning. This was an attempt to kind of revise the information that had been sent to you previously to give you access to those links in case you misplace them, which I never do, right? Um, and then I've provided a table in the information packet, which we will probably be referring to uh, as we go through tonight. And the table is a list of, it's a summary of, of the recommendations, the policy recommendations that are contained within Campaign Zero and 21st Century Policing. <clears throat> It's kind of a spreadsheety looking thing, um, but one of the columns in that spreadsheet is titled, uh, does, does current EPD policy include this question mark? And if there is a why in that column, that's an indication that Eugene Police has a current policy that is uh, very, very similar to the recommendations found in Campaign Zero and 21st Century Policing. There's a number of yeses. And there's a number of ends, which means no, EPD doesn't have that policy. And so those might be areas that this subcommittee might wish to explore this evening, okay? Um, so there's that. Um, some of you might know, <clears throat> Kaz is traveling to London uh, to attend to a family emergency. And so he will not be with us this evening. Uh, he's hoping to be set up electronically and work remotely from London um, starting next week, but uh, you're stuck with me tonight, folks, sorry. Um, <laughs> so you just gotta put up with me. 
Um, and we send Kaz his best, of course. Um, just a reminder, there's a lot of dates floating around there and it's hard to keep everything straight. And um, so I put in a reminder of the future ad hoc committee dates just to kind of make sure everyone has them on their calendar. So meeting number eight, which is the next one, that's going to be next Tuesday. Hello, that's coming up quickly on February 2nd. Meeting eight, February 2nd. Meeting nine, February 17th. Uh, meeting 10, um, March 2nd, meeting 11, March 17th, and the last scheduled meeting, meeting 12, will be March 31st. Uh, that will be a meeting dedicated to uh, the committee, uh, hopefully, <laughs> approving the final report that will be going to City Council. And just FYI, Kaz and I have already started to kind of noodle around and draft some sections of that. Um, and so our intent is to have that report to you as soon after March 17th as humanly possible so that you have time to review that and then are prepared at that last meeting to uh, approve that report. Could um, we see some of that information uh, beforehand? Yeah. So that it's not all thrown on us. Yeah. Um, Sure, Silverio. Um, so, you know, we've we've had an opportunity to kind of draft what what a recommendation might look like, you know, and and we can send that along to to get comments and just so it's not a surprise. But I think you'll be I think you'll be happy with it. I hope so, because um, this committee, the ad hoc committee, has done uh, a lot of hard work and there's been a lot of time invested, and we want to make sure that this report captures kind of like the expertise and the wisdom of this body of folks who have come together on this really important topic. Um, just a reminder that um, as you consider recommendations and motions that we are using what we call the three question format. So um, the first question is, what is the issue that the community is experiencing and in which communities uh, are experiencing this particular problem the most? Uh, what specifically and clearly is your recommended motion? And how do you think that the recommended motion will address the problem and uh, achieve the desired results? So it's kind of a three question format. Keep that in mind. Uh, counselors have suggested that that format will be really helpful for them as they uh, consider the report coming out of this body. Uh, let's see, gosh, I have rambled on long enough. Uh, those are my opening remarks and welcome. Before we get into the um, question answer and, and uh, discussion about body worn cameras, does anyone have any questions about what I said? Okay, I'm hearing none, which is good. Um, yeah, also, I, I, I always uh, want to give a shout out to um, the folks who help put these meetings together, like, you know, host the Zoom platform. And tonight we have Jeremy Cleversy. So thank you, Jeremy. He's uh, there in the background making, yep, hello, thank you. Uh, making sure that things run as smoothly as possible. And we couldn't do it without Jeremy. So thank you. Um, all right. So we're moving into the agenda item number two, which is the bulk of the meeting tonight. And that is beginning the discussions about what kinds of recommendations and motions that you would like to take to the larger committee. And um, I will do my best to facilitate the conversation. Um, and I'm gonna suggest um, that we, uh, open the floor. And uh, if that doesn't get us anywhere, uh, I have a few ideas about what uh, what I can do to help facilitate that conversation. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll open it up um, and see how this goes. Okay. Um, I do have something to start with. Great. Um, I, let me bring my notes up. 
I actually wanted to uh, talk about the possibilities of uh, making motions um, or us to consider um, creating these motions. Um, and I have two. While the officers should not have the ability to turn off or mute the cameras, uh, evidence control should react mater um, material, should redact material that is tactically sensitive if required. Um, that's just something that it has talked up, uh, has been talked about in um, the committee, but we have not necessarily heard motions about it. And I feel like it's something that affects uh, our communities. And then the other one will be uh, the uh, an original, uh, the copy of the original, um, unredacted, so without getting edited, it should be kept up for the viewing by clear personnel or those with clearance, um, like the review, uh, the city review, I mean the civilian review board, uh, the prosecutors or uh, attorneys. Um, so. <clears throat> Yeah, those are the two things that I kind of wanted to uh, bring in into the, the, this subcommittee. Ems, thank you for kicking us off. That's great. And I'm wondering if you have what you just read in a, in a document that you could share on your screen. Is that? I'm on my cell phone because I'm not at home. Okay. Um, but I don't know if I could put it in the chat and then you could just copy it into your computer? Yeah, let's try that because um, I think that might be helpful for folks um, to kind of um, better understand what you just said. Yeah. Um, Okay, so um, I'm looking at two things. I'm going to read them, um, and I'm going to ask if everyone is able to see these in the chat box. Okay, the silence is, is either, no, we can't see it, Kevin, or, yep, we can see it. Uh, currently reading it. Okay. And again, uh, it's, so, so, it's something that it does not have to be word by word. I just know that it, it has been part of the conversations and I think it's also uh, things that impact the, the, the community. So uh, we could totally work on making one that fits this subcommittee and vote on it. Uh, but I just wanted to get the conversation started. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and now I'm doing, um, attempting to get it just captured permanently. As you know, um, most of the time the, the contents in the chat box is not recorded. Right. Um, so I'm gonna make sure that I've got them in a place that will stay. Okay, I've got that. Um, all right, M's. So let's start with the first one here. Officers should not have the ability to turn off or mute their cameras. Evidence control should redact material that is tactic, tactically sensitive if required. Um, have you thought about kind of putting that, and you, you started down that road, but can you elaborate on that three question format? So um, what communities are uh, affected by this? What is the problem that you're trying to solve and how do you think this um, this uh, recommendation would would address the problem? Uh, so the problem that I'm trying to resolve is that uh, communities are not, in general, so uh, uh, BIPOC communities or um, actually or actually even the even white folks, uh, brown folks, anyone uh, that has experienced some sort of police brutality. Uh, feel like there's not enough transparency when it comes down to the recordings. Um, I mean, we have had instances where the cameras fall off and um, that, I mean, that's an accident and 
even then some people uh, think that uh, well that's uh, that was made on purpose and it just does not create the the um, a good rep a report with the police and the community um, so had the police having a, a chance to um, pause their their video when they want to uh, does not increase that uh, confidence in the in, in the police when it comes to our community. Um, so by not allowing them to stop recording, and I know and I understand the different the, the um, in the videos that they uh, that we watch, uh, they gave us different uh, reasons why they don't. Uh, but that's why if it gets uh, basically edited later on, we have the original copy and then an edited copy where all the sensitive information gets taken out. Um, I also understand that that uh, makes, um, basically we, we have to have an editing crew uh, in a sense uh, to go through all the video. Um, so I do understand that that will increase budget uh, in some aspects. Um, but it's, again, it's something that I think it's, it will be very useful uh, and it will bring more transparency into the process. Great. Thank you. Um, I would like now to offer uh, an opportunity to Lieutenant Sam Miguel and then uh, Travis Smith uh, to offer any thoughts, comments, uh, first reactions, and uh, kind of get this conversation going in that direction. Lieutenant? So the only thing I want to say is we currently do have a process for redacting video. And when the redacting does occur, like when things are being released, um, there is always a copy of the unaltered video available. We never get rid of the original. It always stays in the system. OK. Um, is there a time? Officers currently have the ability to uh, turn off or, or mute their cameras. Is, is that correct? Yes. Currently, um, the policy does allow for officers to mute their videos for um, tactical conversations or coaching type conversations. They can also, they also start them and stop them on their own. They're not automatic. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Travis Smith. Uh, hi, thank you for letting me be here today. Um, I think I would probably defer to EPD on the mute function. Uh, it doesn't really impact my office and what we're seeing with when we get these files because uh, whether or not there's a mute, sometimes that may come up at trial or sometimes that's something where a defense attorney has a question about. But for the, th I think what, three years now we've been doing this. Um, it's just, it's, it it's, hasn't been in, us getting that video an issue that's cropped up. Um, and I don't wanna go into a path commenting on what I think EPD should be doing because that's that's their job, uh, mm -hmm. have their position on it. Um, I think that in regards of the redacted, unredacted piece, that, that, that is accurate. I think in the, in the panels that I've participated in this and then some of the conversations that I've had with people, um, how Axon's technology works is, is it's, a, it's challenging, right? Like it's a kind of a new concept to understand. Um, and so, yeah, when, when that video is put in that docking station and downloaded, uh, the system will never let you get rid of it. I know EPD has a select few number of people who can delete things, but anything I do to a video um, when it's shared with my office, I actually get essentially another copy of it. And then I can manipulate that video and do things that I need to do to redact things for people's privacy, uh, redact for, uh, you know, clarity. Sometimes some of these videos are hours and hours and hours, and you don't want a jury to sit there and, and do that and experience that hours of boredom. Um, and so we can, we can do that, but, and, and it's a tool. But that original copy stays, uh, and Axon does a 
really impressive job of keeping track of everybody who touches that file. Mm. So every time someone views, it's recorded who views that video, it's recorded uh, where, they, where they viewed it, what parts of the video they viewed. I mean, it's almost like a keystroke recording of, you know, I rewound it. And, and these are things that are, are kept and retained so that it's really easy to see if uh, what has been done to a video, basically, if there is uh, any concern regarding redacting. So, yeah. Thank you, Travis. Uh, Silverio, I see your hands up. Yeah, I had a question regarding um, the point that, um, uh, I, don't, I don't remember your rank, I'm sorry, San Miguel had. Um, so you said there's an option to mute, but what, what types of conversations are we considering? Like, is it a personal conversation between the two officers? Or is it, it, is it a, a muting option when the officer is having a conversation with their suspect or somebody who they've um, come into contact with? So it's can, generally- I'm sorry. When, oh, no, that's okay. It's generally when the officer is having a conversation with another officer or the sergeant about tactics, like, we're going to do this type of search and we're going to do this or sometimes if they're having kind of a legal conversation about next steps that sort of thing um, it should not be between when they're talking to a suspect or a victim it it's really only when they're having tactical conversations between officer and sergeant or if you're having a coaching conversation between a sergeant and an officer like you know correcting something that they're doing or whatever Um, the other thing I had as, uh, as a question was um, how much information and how long are we looking at as far as storage uh, with the drone footage, with the body cams, with the uh, um, dash cams? So the storage really varies. Um, if it is a homicide or a sex crime or a serious felony or an internal affairs case that's sensitive, it'll be stored forever. It'll be put into a sensitive category that's stored forever. If it is, say, an officer is dispatched to a disorderly subject and they go, they handle the call and they clear no crime, then that is held for 190 days just in case something comes up and we need it. If there's a complaint, or there's another call for service associated to it. So the minimum something will be held is 190 days. The maximum is forever. And there's you know some things that are held for five years, some things that are held for two, and a lot of it has to do with statute of limitations. Like DUIIs, I believe they're held for five right now. Travis can correct me if I'm wrong. So it really does vary on what it is, but if it's a call where there's no crime, the minimum would be 190 days. Five years for a DYI. Thank you. Ems, I see your hand. I, so I, I had a question about, about mics um, or a muting feature. Um, if the, why is it important for the officers to mute themselves when there's already an editing process going on where you could take things out of? I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Um, so why, why if, it, if the footage is already re being reviewed before it goes into court or uh, uh, making it shorter and already being edited, why is it important that officers could mute themselves? So officers cannot edit at all. We have very few people who can do any editing and they're in our forensic evidence unit or our evidence control unit. Um, so there would be no way for the officers to mute it afterwards. And it would be quite a workload for someone to just go through video and edit any tactical conversations. Other questions? I, could, I just wanted to sort of dovetail off that a little bit with Lieutenant sure. San Miguel. Um, and, and maybe has been said before, these uh, pointed out in these conversations. 
Um, with, with the editing piece, I don't know if there's a, an appreciation for just, just how massive the amount of data is. And so for, just for my office, right, you're looking at uh, only body cams where uh, there was a body cam recorded and there was a referral for a crime to my office, right? Which is a very, that's 5,000 cases, probably on average 10 to 15,000 videos at least. Uh, so to review those after the fact would be, uh, I mean, it would be an almost insurmountable workload. Um, when we edit and redact things in my office, it's pretty labor intensive. Uh, and I'm sure it is over at EPD as well. And we only do it very, very rarely. It's for a case that is going to trial or a case where someone has requested the video and it's a, a, a active criminal case. And so we kind of control the record when it's an active criminal case. Uh, and so it's when, when uh, Lieutenant San Miguel says it's, it's, it's pretty labor intensive, I mean, it is, it would be an insane amount of work to do that. It, was, it just really would. And that's the challenge with body cam, right? You just have all this data that you just have to work with. So. Thank you, Travis. Um, I would like to uh, read a question that's in the chat box from Sandra. Uh, Sandra says, I agree, if it can be redacted, why would the mute function be necessary? And perhaps Lieutenant Sam Miguel could respond. Again, I just really think it's time intensive to do that without um, saying too much, you know, I don't disagree that our mute policy could be tightened up and there are times when officers mute when they shouldn't or they don't really need to. They think it's a, you know, very tactical conversation and it's not necessarily and um, unfortunately, sometimes when they mute, they forget to turn it back on. Um, but I just think it would be really time intensive to go review all the videos and redact them after the fact. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome Chief Skinner uh, to our subcommittee meeting. Chief, do uh, you have any comments or thoughts about this conversation? Well, that's dangerous. Asking the <laughs> chief if he has any thoughts about a conversation <laughs> when it comes to this. Um, we are we're really taking a look at our at our mute policy now. We've had a couple instances where. Uh, there was no audio or video or both that were, was real head scratchers for me. And we've held officers accountable for violating that mute, po that, that, uh, mute policy. And so I'm, I would entertain, I would, I would be encouraged to entertain something that tightens that up a little bit. Uh, you know, for, for years and years, we talked about not, um, muting when we're talking about tactics and we're really kind of moved past that quite frankly in a sense that there's no mystery behind what we do or even being able to hear how we do what we do i understand on a case-by-case -case basis there might be something super sensitive in there that we wouldn't want for public consumption that maybe would erode officer safety but it's really infrequent uh the piece that i do i am protective of though is the personnel piece of, of when we have an officer or a sergeant out in the field that's trying to correct the action of a recruit officer or an officer and basically admonishing this person and, and trying to be a good coach out in the field, I don't think that that's a, that should be for public consumption at all. That's not anybody's business, but between those two employees uh, trying to uh, become better police officers. And so I would be protective of that. I think when it comes to the conversation about redacting uh, and just not muting anything and redacting is there are certain cases that we have when uh, people request body cam or we know that body cam is going to be made a part of the public record that are indicators that there's something about that case to that lead us to believe that there's sensitive information that we need to redact. And so when that happens, and it's infrequent, but when it happens, like for instance, certain victims or victims identity, or as Travis put it, you know, certain uh, prosecutions that will go in and, and we'll redact that. 
Um, if we had to go in and evaluate every single video that was going to be released for public consumption, uh, start to finish, it would it would be um, it would be a real challenge for us. And 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 one of those things, it's not that we couldn't do it. We would just have to build a system in which we could we could do that. And so, Vario, your, your point about the the records retention. I mean, there's long retentions and there's short retentions. The piece that is so staggering is the amount of storage that it takes for this PD, the amount of money that we spend on storage of video and audio files, uh, just to, to make sure that we have those is, is staggering at this point. We're really struggling with that. We had that conversation when we were discussing the drone footage. I don't know if you recall, but you know, at this point in time, if we're talking about 21st century policing, it doesn't just mean having uh, trust within the community, it also means having that technology component. And right. I'm fine with the budget, you know, being increased to make sure that some of that footage is saved. I personally, as a person who is a privacy person, uh, don't think that all of it is necessary. And I would be fine with getting rid of uh, footage as soon as it, it can be tossed. Yeah, and I think we are too. We're at, we're at a place where we want to follow Oregon public records law and start purging stuff the minute that we legally can do that. Uh, that makes a lot of sense um, for our storage capabilities, but it just makes a lot of sense for privacy issues. And 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 understand, you know, when we have these body cams on, you know, it's really it's really important for us to be able to articulate when they should go on and when they should go off, and, and not just blanketly say body cam should be on all the time. I don't. You know, that's I think that's cost prohibitive. And I think you get a lot of of stuff in there that, that that doesn't need to be in there. And, you know, there's there's those calls that we go on that are really sensitive domestic violence calls. We'll go into somebody's house in a domestic violence situation and whether or not there's, you know, some privacy rights to that victim from being filmed while we're dealing with uh, domestic violence or child sexual abuse or any of those things. There's there's a victim. Um, there's a victim uh, lens that we need to look at when we think about body cam as well, because oftentimes uh, that is forgotten uh, in all of this as well. Thank you, Chief. Um, I've got a few people in the queue with their hands up, but uh, before I get to the folks who have their hands up, I want to read uh, a response from Sandra who asked a question previously. Sandra says in the chat, thank you. For, for answering, but my concern would be, what if tactics being discussed are not acceptable tactics? I feel um, that would, would be useful for reviewing in most cases, even if only by the review process and not the public. All right, thank you, Sandra. Um, I'm going to, I'm gonna kind of jump the queue a little bit and ask Jeremy, um, to go ahead with this question, because I think you have a kind of uh, a question that you might want to let someone in to the panelists. Is that correct? So uh, that is a possibility. You have Ibrahim Kalabali, who um, has a question, and that we normally wouldn't allow somebody from the audience, but because it's a member of the committee, I thought I'd offer you that. And sure. Secondly, we do. Uh, so go ahead with that then. Um, you know, Ibrahim is a member of the ad hoc committee. Um, I leave it up to the subcommittee if you'd want to entertain his question. I see a head nod, a couple head nods. Sure. Uh, let's let Ibrahim in and um, let me get to the folks ahead of him and then we can get to his question. One more question in the sure is coming, uh, it says, what are the three questions that should guide us again? So yeah, so thank that. you. Uh, I think that was Silverio. Um, one of the things that I find about this whole Zoom thing is that it requires you to multitask and folks, multitasking is not my like skill set. <laughs> so I'm doing my best to kind of pay attention to what's going on in the chat, but I apologize, Silverio. Um, I will get that posted here the three question format. Uh, thanks, Jeremy, for reminding me. All right, Ems, you are next. And I think you're muted. Always happens. Um, yep. 
So I there's I have a little bit of a comment and also of a clarification. So uh, my comment is that yes, when a police officer goes to a domestic abuse or um, child abuse a situation, there might be recording. Uh, if they're recording all the time, there might be uh, compromises uh, um, privacy of uh, the people in the house. But at the same time, we have seen. Um, a lot of times that domestic abuse turns, or, turns also into a police brutality or turns into a police escalating the situation. So it will be helpful to have the cameras on in case of something, if something like that happens. Um, uh, and also I wanted to get uh, some clarification. Uh, I know that uh, Chief Skinner touched up a, a little bit, um, but why is it so important that tactical converse, uh, that tactical conversations have to be muted? Um, Chief Kinner says that they're kind of trying to move away from that. Um, so if you could talk more about that, and I just want to actually point out at a comment that um, that was made in the chat. Let me see if I could track it. Which, which is Sandra? Um, and she has a very good point. It says, if tactics being discussed are not acceptable tactics, then it will be helpful for us to know of uh, this uh, not so good of tactics that officers are talking about. Um, so, yes. Thank you, Ems. Um, Chief, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, let me see if I can pick this off one at a time. Um, Kevin's not good with multitasking. And so I compound questions. I have to take them slow. So forgive me. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, thanks for your comment. When, when I talk about going into domestic violence uh, situations or those situations when we're entering people's homes, there are situations sometimes where turning off that camera is appropriate. I don't need 200 police officers that have access to body cam footage, seeing somebody that's underclothed or in a state that is that is so um, embarrassing, it's just it's not worth it. And I think we can articulate that th that camera went off because we were in a situation where where somebody was in an embarrassing uh, position as a victim, and and that happens more times than you would than you would think. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, protecting victims. Is that uh, we want to capture the, the dialogue, we want to capture the scene, we want to be able to do the things we do uh, to be able to, to capture uh, a, a good investigation, especially in domestic violence or or physical or sexual abuse. But every once in a while, when we're in people's homes, we see things that other people shouldn't have to or shouldn't be um, allowed to view. Um, out of respect to that person and victim. So that's that's kind of const the, the, the construct around my comments there. Um, the tactical situation. So in, in many situations before we do go do anything, there's a lot of dialogue about tactics and different approaches and different strategies. And some are, are, are better than others. Some uh, will be more effective than others. Uh, part of really good tactical decision-making is making sure that there's a few people in that conversation that have good pieces of information so that we can make the best decisions about how we're going to approach a critical incident. Ultimately, when we carry out those tactics, those tactics are, are, are seen and, and evaluated. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand uh, a situation where somebody could be talking about tactics that somehow um, would be, the, I'm not sure I understand the value in being able to, to um, evaluate a discussion about tactics when ultimately the tactics that we, we land on are what we're held, held uh, responsible for. Uh, having said all of that, like I said earlier, um, I'm in a position where I think that this police department sometimes takes that, that conversation about quote unquote tactics to a, to a level that allows for more muting than we need to have. And so I'm, I'm ready to kind of pull back that a little bit and allow for more of those conversations to be recorded um, because I do think that that is open for interpretation and you know, where, do, where does that stop? I mean, what's, what's considered a tactical discussion? Is it how I'm gonna approach this car or is it how 
you know, the tactical team is going to go rescue this hostage. I mean, those are two hugely different situations. And technically, if you're articulating, well, we are talking about tactics, so we muted, it's kind of a crutch. And so removing that crutch, I think, makes a lot of sense. And I, I just don't see that it puts us uh, in uh, significant harm's way by doing that. Thank you, Chief. Um, Erica has had her hand up for some time, and I'm going to call on her. And then it is Lieutenant San Miguel next. And I want to get to Ibrahim Kulabali. Erica? Good evening. So I was wondering um, if if there were provide to us uh, the mute, the turn off camera policy, because I don't recall uh, having that information. I would like to, you know, because I it, you know, uh, I hear people talking about that there is a turn off camera policy, but I don't know what what implies on it, like, you know, like it would be good to know what is the criteria that is chosen. Because, you know, when I'm thinking about a camera, I'm thinking, you know, I'm a teacher, you know, like uh, as a teacher, I cannot be with a student one-on-one, uh, -on -one, right? So for me, a camera, actually it helps me because it's protecting me as a professional, as a teacher, you know, it's protecting me and it's protecting my student. So it will not make sense for me as a teacher that I'm going to, I'm doing this job uh, and I'm giving this tool. It, uh, it will not make sense to me to turn off that, that, that camera if the camera is a tool for me to protect my integrity, protect the integrity of the person, to be able to keep a record. And uh, you know, obviously like there is certain things that, that we don't want, you know, we don't want to dehumanize people. And we know that images can dehumanize people, but you know, sometimes we, we don't even need images. In some cases, people have been dehumanized just by words, right? So I just feel, um, I just uh, really don't understand why would, uh, you know, this tool that is there to protect everyone is, what is the criteria to most? So I, I will request if it's possibility for us to get a hold of those policies so we can, Give it a look and see what is that criteria. Uh, yeah, Erica, it is very possible. We'll make sure that that gets sent out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lieutenant San Miguel and then Abdul Rahman. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of mimic what the, um, what, sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, what Erica said about, um, being protected by the camera and having that footage. And many of our officers prefer to have the camera on all the time because it protects them as well from false allegations. The other thing I wanted to point out is that when we wrote our policy, we specifically put language in there for sensitive interviews and situations that allows the officers to cover the camera lens. And they can do that by slipping a rubber glove over it or turning it backwards, but the policy does allow it. And in the policy, we give a couple examples of when it might be appropriate. One would be interviewing a sexual assault victim in the hospital. Um, you might wanna cover the camera lens and not have it recorded, but still have the audio. Another one would be taking a burglary report in someone's home if they don't want camera footage of them and being inside their home. So we do specifically call that out in our policy because we knew it would be sensitive for people. Thank you, Lieutenant. Abdul Rahman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, when there is an incident, maybe a murder, maybe uh, social misconduct, uh, a car accident, somebody dies in the streets, if there is a witness, it's usually a good thing. It will solve the dispute in very timely manner and it will speed things up. And sometimes even the witnesses can lie. So if we use the camera or we we'll consider the camera as a witness, something that does not lie, it could be very, very helpful in a very awkward situation where a dispute cannot be solved without that eye, that extra eye. And it will tell the truth. 
I understand the concerns about the, uh, the police doing their job. Sometimes they say thanks to each other. They don't want it exposed. I also take into account, yes, I'm, I'm going to a domestic uh, violence problem or I don't want to expose somebody who is naked or in an appropriate situation. But the significance of having this witness in terms of the camera, where it's very, very necessarily uh, needed and can be useful to solve a problem, it may clarify somebody can be accused of killing and they did not, or somebody who committed the accident and they did not. Uh, the camera can be a, a very strong, powerful uh, element in solving a dispute and a problem. So yes, I understand it could be switched off or set aside temporarily in, in a situation where it's not very dangerous or not very serious. There is lots of situations where I don't need the camera even. And once the time passed, you keep it as long as the records allow, short or long. But when there is something serious, and the camera was there, it will help a lot to solve some important disputes, in my opinion. Thank you, Abdul Rahman. Um, I would like to give Ibrahim Kulabali an opportunity to ask his question. And then I think we've got some other folks um, in the queue here. And here you're witnessing Kevin trying to multitask. It's not a pretty sight. Sorry. You're doing great. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> uh, Welcome, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, um, I, I want to thank all my peers on, on this subcommittee and also say hi to Chief Skinner. Um, just briefly, you know, if you look, this is my, I'm in my living room. If you look at here, I have two cameras in my living room. Run in my house, I have 14 cameras in my house. So I think we're talking about recording and access to the footage. So I think, I strongly believe that recording is not the problem because before we provide the footage, we can edit it. We can edit anything personal. We can edit anything that uh, I will expose uh, uh, all the people involved. We can, we can edit all, all the personal information. So I think it's very important that that mute future that they have in the, in the tactical the tactical information is a tool for the police department for the training department to listen to what conversation the police officers are having on the field when they are facing a situation and have to make decisions. And that can be a training tool. And to me, taking away that, that, that future will allow the police department to assess their own uh, 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 training uh, or the, 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 the also to monitor how uh, uh, the, the officers are you know, acting on, on the field and identify area, areas of uh, improvement and potentially offer some training. So I think it's very important that yes, if you are on break, I, I, I used to work at Oregon State Hospital. We are on camera 24 seven, there is no mute. Cameras are there 24 seven, whatever you do. But when someone uh, requests information to the state of, uh, uh, of Oregon, if the governor receive a request of information, they will redact anything that pertain to someone's privacy. So I think to build like uh, Silver was talking about, to kind of build that trust, we have to consider uh, 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 um, 
taking away that feature. I, I, and I'm sorry, I had I raised my hand because I saw the feature. I didn't want to jump in, but I didn't know if I was allowed to speak. But since you gave me the opportunity, I want to say thank you. Thank you for all what you do. Thank you for being here. And I want you to consider making the recommendation, a policy recommendation. And uh, the Lieutenant San Miguel said that she, she thinks that it can be tightened up. Chief Skinner, also voice the fact that yeah sometimes he had to scratch his head because and and I think we can help the police officers on the ground not to have gray areas because that's where they get themselves in trouble so let's take that away so they don't get themselves in trouble thank you Ibrahim thank you uh, we're glad that you were able to join us and uh, thank you for your comments. Um, Silverio, uh, then Ems, and um, also a comment in the chat from Sandra that I want to read into the record. Silverio. Yes, thank you. So I wanted to bring it back to a more focused conversation on the policies that we had that were presented to us as they were. Um, I sent an email to Jeremy. It was with the hopes that he would be able to share that with the uh, the committee, but um, as as we've all been given the policies, we could just look at them one by one if that's okay. Uh, are you referring to the uh, spreadsheet that was included in the information packet? I am. Okay. All right. Um, I would certainly move on to that. I feel like we've got a little bit of a loose end here with M's uh, proposal and uh, if we could spend a little bit more time on that, um, I think that would be productive. And then we can get to that uh, spreadsheet with a list of policies. Does that sound like a plan, Silverio, or is that, that okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, Ems, you are next, and uh, then Chief Skinner. Go ahead, Ems. From what I have heard, the only way to keep the uh, audio recording is to have something covering the actual camera, right? Uh, yes, Chief or Lieutenant uh, Sam Miguel. Yes, that's correct. If you wanna keep the audio recording, then you have to put something over the lens. And one thing that officers always have on them are rubber gloves and they do fit just perfectly over the top. So, um, and when, what is the policy of the video recording uh, getting released to family and the public, uh, if necessary to the public, but at least to the family? We have state law that um, prohibits the re release of body-worn camera footage specifically. It's actually different than in-car camera footage. The state of Oregon passed a house bill that prohibited the release of that, except under very specific circumstances that have to do with a public interest case. With that being said, the video can still be released through a request, through a defense attorney, or a citizen who was specifically involved in the incident. But if my neighbors have a domestic dispute at their house and I'm curious as to what happened, I cannot go and get a copy of that footage. Or if you know, someone were to get arrested for DUII who's a public figure, um, not just anybody can go get that footage unless it rises to the level of being a public interest case. Um, so if let's say, if I get shot by someone, doesn't have to be the police, but there was a police camera in there and I die, uh, my partner cannot request them. It has to be an attorney. No, it could be requested. And so say you are shot and we have a video of a suspect that was somehow captured, that could be released to the public because of the public interest in the case. Um, and yes, your partner could request it, but there would have to be a reason. And then we would also be required by law to redact the faces in that. So if there were other citizens perhaps that witnessed it, we would have to redact those. 
And is there a time limit to that? No, I don't believe there's a time limit. The time limit would fall under how long we have the video. But if it was a homicide or something like that, we would keep the video forever, indefinitely. Thank you for that. And uh, my last comment is a little bit of what Abraham was saying. Um, uh, like if I have work and if I work in any sort of store or something, there's cameras recording 24 seven. Uh, and if I do something wrong, um, the, that is exponentially wrong that I will get management uh, involved, like they could see that footage and then they will be either able to understand uh, why it happened or why what happened. Uh, they will be able to um, give the proper either um, punishment or uh, either firing me or giving me the proper training. And at the same time, they will, uh, if something happens to, uh, to, and I know it has happened in stores where people get um, uh, sexually assaulted and physically assaulted, which is still embarrassed, is still recorded, but it also helps to the part of the investigation and also it gets there. So the video recording in general, what I'm getting at, it helps a lot into figuring out uh, the problems within the, the um, the entity and also outside of the entity. Uh, and I understand there will be a lot of money. I'm not saying that we should be recording all the time, but I, I wanted to point that out that there's uh, benefits like Ibrahim was saying, uh, and I agree with them of having more recording. Uh, yeah, and I don't think I know if someone has a comment about that, I'm, I'm happy to hear it, but I don't, I don't think I need one. Okay, thanks, Ems. And you know, uh, as we go through this discussion, Ems, I, I hope you're thinking about um, you know how to incorporate some of the comments and questions that that we've talked about tonight into your kind of supposal. And not saying that we have to have a you know perfectly worded uh, motion this evening, but um, there's been a lot of good conversation and perspectives. Uh, Chief Skinner, and then I'm, I'll read uh, Sandra's comment to the subcommittee. Go ahead, Chief. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Just um, wanted to create some context as you guys. I love this conversation, by the way. So um, this is kind of this is the kind of the stuff that we really I feel uh, we really need to clean up. And so I do like the conversation. Couple things though, when we talk about, and I've heard this statement made a couple times: recording all the time. It's important for you to, to, to better communicate or at least land on when you believe that start and stop time should be. And as a matter of context, if we looked at from the moment an officer got on duty to the moment he or she left that we want all of that recorded, we're looking at an excess of 400,000 hours of recording a year for my staff. Um, and, and you can, and that's just, that's an astronomical amount of storage an astronomical amount of, 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 uh, of video. So being able to kind of contextually see what it is we're trying to capture and what we're not, I think is important uh, to be able to do. It would be interesting to do an analysis of our existing system of everything that we record, which is definitely tens of tens of thousands of hours of recording a year. The amount of time that we purposefully mute for the policy reasons of coaching, counseling, or tactics is, is would be, my guess would be it'd be less than less than a half a percent of those hours are actually done that. Now, having said that, I'm not so naive as to believe that there isn't times where people have turned their cameras off that have been outside of policy that we just don't know about. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not believing that we're doing everything perfectly all the time. And so just as a matter of context, I think that's important. And then the last thing about home audio and video and stuff is it's illegal to record people's conversations without them being aware of it. So most of the, most of the video surveillance that you see in stores is video only, not audio. Um, and the only way you can record somebody's conversations is you tell them that they're being recorded and give them a chance to say no thanks. And we, do, we have to do that as well. We have to let people know that this is being audio and video recorded. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the apples and oranges comparison to an awful lot of the surveillance that you see happening. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, 
in some cases you'll see some stores that specifically say under video surveillance and your and audio being recorded and if that's prominently displayed that can meet the criteria for unlawful interception of communications but in in oregon we have to give that advisory to people that we're recording audio um, from and so just just another little tidbit of information as you guys kind of land on on something that makes sense for us thank you chief i'd like to read a comment from sandra that's in the chat box just into the record uh, thank you ibrahim we also have the ability to restrict who has access to view videos and hold officials accountable for viewing video they are restricted to. All right, uh, I want to welcome Joel. Uh, see you have uh, joined us tonight. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, Ims, I think at this point, I am going to ask that um, if you could just kind of, I'm going to put you on the hot seat a little bit here, sorry. But at the top of your head, um, you know, this has been a really, uh, a, a good productive conversation. What are the things that you heard that you might want to incorporate into the proposal that you started this meeting with? And I'm not asking for a perfect, you know, ready to go to the printer type of thing, but just kind of your first impressions. I will definitely uh, give more thought about muting the, uh, the muting policy. Uh, and like Chip Skinner says, we know that it's not always possible. And there's also state laws that prevent full recording and it's expensive. So another uh, thing to munch on is uh, when the, the recording should start and stop, uh, which is another hard to think to gauge because um, I don't think the, they have an automatic thing. Uh, the officer has to actually press it. Um, and I, I mean, I understand that's hard because like, I don't know when something's gonna happen. Um, so thinking about all of that. Um, and yeah, I, I do not have like, a, again, a concrete thing. Thanks for putting me in the hot spot. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have all, a bunch of notes right here uh, in my pad. So I'll cool. keep looking at it. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to ask you to kind of keep that uh, front and center between now and the second subcommittee meeting and be prepared to uh, have a, you know, a more carefully worded uh, proposal to bring to the subcommittee. And um, sounds like you've got some other folks on the subcommittee that might be interested in helping you with that. Now, um, here's another Kevin, thing. Can I'm, I ask a question real quick? Of course. Is there, is there a, it, as, as people think about trying to formulate a policy recommendation for, uh, is there, is there a mechanism by which they have access to staff that they can bounce things off so that they don't feel like they're, they're coming in uh, without the pieces of information? I think about what we're trying to accomplish on this particular policy and given members of this committee access to either me or Angie as they're writing some things down might be really helpful. I just wanna offer that as a resource. I'm not saying we need to be involved. I just wanna offer that as a resource. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. And so this is how it would have to work and we can do this and we've done this before is that the communication goes through the facilitation team. So that would be either myself or Kaz and then we pass that along and we kind of act as a mediary not the most efficient way to do it, but um, that is kind of how it has to work. And I appreciate the offer of help. So uh, Ems uh, and others reach out to me and I'll be happy to pass uh, questions and comments along. Um, so Vario, I see your hand and I have one quick question before we move on. And uh, well, it's not a question, it's a comment. Um, but one thing uh, that the, uh, not only this subcommittee, but the entire ad hoc committee uh, you know, should always keep in the back of their mind and it's come up, others have brought this up. So this is not a new idea. This is not Kevin's idea. Uh, but one, one possibility that is available to this body is to make a recommendation to the council that the police commission or another existing committee examine this particular topic, whatever that is. So in this case, we're talking about body-worn cameras. It's possible um, that, uh, you know, instead of agonizing over wordsmithing a, a motion uh, that, uh, that would go into the report, it's possible that this subcommittee and the ad hoc committee can make a recommendation to council saying, hey, we would like the police commission to take a look at 
X, Y, and Z. Just a possibility that I throw out there for you to consider. Silverio. As a person on the commission, I was hoping that this committee would take care of that. <laughs> okay. Honest. All right. Um, so here's the thing. I wanted to look at some of the policies that we've been presented with and just kind of have a question as to why these are policy issues that we should consider. Okay. Um, I sent that to Jeremy and specifically regarding, and I'm just going to go through them really quickly because it's, uh, we're pressed for time at this point. Uh, AC HCPP6 law enforcement agencies should deploy smart technology that is designed to prevent the tampering with or man manipulating of evidence in violation of policy. Uh, the EPD policy currently does include this. What type of smart technology are we discussing? ACHCPP7, uh, the implementation of appropriate technology by law enforcement agency agencies should be designed considering local needs to be and aligned with national standards. Uh, what standards and what type of technology? Again, my concern is what type of technology are we um, discussing? Uh, ACHCPP8, law enforcement agents, agencies should include an evaluation or assessment process to gauge the effectiveness, effectiveness of any new technology soliciting input from all levels of the agency, from line officer to leadership, as well as assessment from members and from members of the community. I would like to have the EPD Police Commission included in that as well. And again, what type of technology are we discussing? Um, with regard to the ACHCPP9, ban police officers from taking cell phones and other recording devices without a person's consent or warrant and give people the right to sue police departments if they take or destroy these devices. We currently do not institute this, uh, but it does say that the EPD does not prohibit it, but it does limit it. Um, I would like us to look at that policy. I personally have no issue uh, currently with the ACHCPP10 requiring officers with body cams to record all enforcement interactions to present, prevent officers from having discretions uh, discretion to turn off the cameras. Um, I think that's valuable. Um, CPP 11, notify subjects that they have, have the option to remain anonymous and stop recording and storing footage if they choose this option. I'm open to a discussion about that. Um, in what ways could that be beneficial to the community? How could that help um, the trust between a, a, you know, a stop or a, somebody who's a suspect? Uh, CPP 12 allows civilians to review footage of themselves or their relatives and request this be released to the public and stored for at least two years. We do not do that. And I would like for us to have that discussion at the subcommittee level the next time we meet. Require body cam and dash cam footage to be stored externally and ensure that the district attorney and civilian oversight structures have direct access to that. It's only partially enacted at that point. I'd like to have, have a discussion about having that um, be um, more enacted. Uh, CPP 14, police uh, require police departments whenever they want to deny a Freedom of Information Act or FOIA to uh, request for a body cam or dash cam footage to prove in court that the, the footage constitute, uh, constitutes a legitimate FOIA exemption. I don't think there should be any FOIA exemptions. It's partially enacted. I want us to have a discussion at the subcommittee level. Uh, concerning that particular policy. I have no issue with CPP 16. Consider whether cameras or mandated footage are tampered with or unavailable as a negative evidentiary factor. I got to say that word. In administrative and criminal proceedings, uh, that is something that we currently do. I agree with that. Uh, to prevent officers, CCC, CPP 17, re prevent officers from reviewing footage of an incident before completing initial reports statements or interviews about an incident. Uh, we do not do that. And I can see the reason why that might be beneficial, but I could also see some reasons why that might be um, an issue. So I have a question regarding that one in particular. I have no uh, disagreement with CPP 18, prohibit footage from being used in tandem with facial recognition software. I do not believe and I do not feel that the city of Eugene should be using facial recognition software in any capacity. Uh, so um, 
I agree with that one. And CPP 19 to update the privacy laws to protect civilians from having video or audio recordings released publicly. So um, that do not contain potential evidence in a use of force in incident, uh, misconduct incident or discharge of a weapon or death that's not available. I think that we should um, get some more information from from the department and have a consideration and have a discussion about that particular policy. So very, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen um, and I will show you the um, the spreadsheet that uh, Saverio was just mentioning. It's included in your information packet if you want to access it that way. Um, and let's take a look. Let's see how, how well Kevin did. I'm assuming that you can all see that. Is that correct? Are you able to see the spreadsheet? Okay. Um, if you zoom so, in to 150%. Sorry? Could you zoom in to 150? Is that helping? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just a quick summary of what Silverio ran through. Uh, these ACH CPP numbers are just an internal number that uh, Kaz and I developed just to keep track of these things. Uh, the, the next column over is the recommended policy from Campaign Zero and or 21st Century Policing. And then the next column is an indication whether that policy exists currently in EPD policies. And so, so Vario, um, if I remember correctly, the first one that you wanted to have a discussion on was this one, number nine, ban police officers from taking cell phones. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I do have questions about the first three. Okay. Um, but that is correct. That is the one that I think that we should look at as a, as a committee. All right. Thank you. Uh, quick hand up from Joel. Oh, I might, I might just wait. I feel like we should go through this. I have a, I have some questions, but. Okay, oh, okay great. All right. Um, and the little timekeeper in me is looking at the clock and we have approximately 47 minutes left. All right. So Vario, uh, let's start with uh, this number six. You had a question or wanted some comment. Yeah. So there's um, some technology that's available now that's, um, there's facial recognition technology. Does the city of Eugene employ racial uh, rec facial recognition technology? Okay. And uh, um, there's also there's also the all license cameras that are installed on police vehicles that can scan and take copy of. Uh, police plates or different plates, wherever they're they're interacting with different um, bodies. That is a camera, and is that something that the city of, of Eugene has? Okay, a question. Uh, I see Lieutenant San Miguel has uh, turned her camera on, which indicates maybe she wants to answer that question. Yeah, neither of those are technologies that we currently have, and to my knowledge, and I've been here thirty years, those are not. Um, capabilities that I have ever been involved with a discussion about. So I don't even think it's on the table for us. And Chief Skinner can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not something we've looked at or are interested in. Okay. Uh, the actual term is automated license plate readers. Yeah, ALPR. Yeah, and, and we do have L ALPR in the city, but it's used exclusively out at the airport and with parking enforcement to be able to determine cars that have been there and have been remained there too long. Uh, and so I would, uh, you know, I want just in full disclosure, there is L ALPR technology in the city, but it's not within your police department. My former police department had ALPR cars, uh, specifically uh, they would be matched up to a hot list of stolen vehicles that would give the officer the alert when that plate comes is seen by the technology to know that they just passed or behind a stolen vehicle. And that's mostly what those are used for is for uh, stolen vehicle recovery. But it's currently not, not being used in the city by any No, we, 
not by any officer. We have uh, the, the airport and parking officers are the only ones that have ALPR. No police officers are, are utilizing that. And how about uh, facial rec recognition technology that's being used or utilized at stoplights? None. Um, so some questions regarding what type of uh, technology in the first three policies would be something that would be beneficial, I think, to the subcommittee. Okay, so questions regarding what technologies uh, are relevant or implied in those first three, is that correct? Correct. All right. And Erica, I see your hand up. And as soon as I get through writing this note, I'm going to call on you, OK? Sounds good. OK. Fastest note writer in the West. Go ahead, Erica. So uh, Silver mentioned something about it, um, but I wanted to ask, uh, I didn't hear the answer. Uh, what are the consequences for tampering or concealing evidence by disabling body cameras? All right. Um, consequences for disabling or concealing uh, body camera. If we could have a quick answer to that, and then we can proceed with the uh, spreadsheet discussion. Lieutenant Sam Miguel or Chief Skinner? I'll go ahead and go since Angie and Angie was in charge of IA for a number of years. So it's a policy violation that would get investigated. It would be considered an allegation of misconduct uh, that would be classified by the auditor's office based on my experience. Uh, the outcome of that would be predicated on a number of things, whether or not we were able to prove that it was intentional or accidental. And quite honestly, um, through progressive discipline, if this was a uh, an issue that we had seen more than once in an officer, it could rise to the level of suspension up to and including termination. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Erica? Yes. All right, excellent. So, Barry Elm. Sorry, on that, um, was this something that was considered in Officer Samuel Teichel's interaction with uh, Eliborio Rodriguez. The, um, the lack of functioning of the body cam was something that was, uh, we dug into off the top of my head. I don't remember, uh, specifically the questions that were asked of officer Teichel at that particular time. Um, I think the, what, what we looked at was the way the body cam shut off in the sense of what was happening at the time uh, of when the body cam all of a sudden uh, shut off. And it was, it was consistent with uh, a body cam that had hit the ground and, and malfunctioned as opposed to the discretionary time to reach down and turn it off. So, but, but to your point, yes, that, that's something that we always look at because it's so infrequent that we have body cam video to help support at least parts of the interactions we have with people that when we don't have body cam, our first question is, why didn't we have body cam? And so we're trying to get to the bottom of that. Thank you, Chief. Saverio, so, I believe we are on the item number nine, ban police officers from taking cell phones or other recording devices. Is that correct? Is that your next question? Uh, that is question? correct. And I do want to have a conversation with the rest of the subcommittee about um, why that is currently something that is a limit, but not a prohibition. I definitely think that a person's cell phone now and in, in this day and age is uh, much more than just a tool. It's um, actually a, a functioning thing that um, is used for, for multiple um, different applications in their, in their lives. 
So I, I, I definitely feel that that should not be something that is uh, an option. And then uh, regarding the uh, uh, policy 11, notify subjects that they have an option to remain anonymous. Um, as far as a ad hoc committee and, and the consideration of the, the community, how could this benefit um, a suspect or somebody who's been approached by an officer and weigh that against the potential conflict of uh, escalation, something happening, and then that footage not being an option. Um, and to allow the civilians to review the footage of themselves or their relatives. Uh, again, there is no policy considering, um, there is no policy with this, with the EPD, according to this spreadsheet. Um, I definitely think it's something that we should look into Okay, um, so Vario, let me jump in and just give Joel an opportunity to ask his question. He's had his hand up for a little bit of time. Is is uh, Joel? No, thank you. Um, I was hoping we can go to this silver if you're okay with it, um, one at a time. We could have a discussion from the top and then just go down from there. Is that okay? Okay, great. So starting with the first one, um, you know, I th there is a man. Uh, by the main of, I forget his first name, his name is, last name is Lupin. He was a 1921 Nobel laureate. And he said that um, technology is a useful servant, uh, but a dangerous master. And I think that's the situation we're in right now in that we've found time and time again that technology itself does not produce accountability. Um, if that was the case, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. And the thing that I've seen over and over again is that I've seen body, body cams being used for tactical reasons within police departments across our nation versus strategic reasons. And just to explain that further, tactical in the sense that, you know, holding residents accountable for their actions or if there's, you know, something that, that happened, usually law enforcement agencies will use it in, in court proceedings or cases or um, to sort of prove that something didn't happen. So it seems to me that recently the body cams have been used to, uh, to sort of hold residents accountable. Um, and then also when atrocities happen, right, we have video footage and that further um, sort of like causes distrust within our community. But on the other hand, right, like as body cams have shown not just the missteps and, and wrongdoings of law enforcement, it's also been used as a tool to hold residents accountable for their actions. I believe that pe people's personal cell phones um, serve a similar purpose, uh, right? I don't walk around with a body cam, but I do have an iPhone, right? And um, <clears throat> have had situations in which I've taken it out to record things. And so <clears throat> in the same way that law enforcement, both in EPD and across our state and across our nation have access to body cams um, to hold themselves accountable, to hold residents accountable. I believe that, you know, it's every resident's right to also record the surroundings and record law enforcement agents. And um, currently I can't take a law enforcement's body cam, but law enforcement can take my cell phone. And um, I don't think that should, we should, that should be the case. Thank you, Joel. I see the chief's hand is up for a comment. So this is a this is a great discussion and one that's deeply rooted in in legal practice. And so Travis, I'm sure, can speak more clearly to this than I can. I agree with you, Joel, in the sense that while um, Oregon is a is basically a two party consent state when we're when we're interviewing or when we're recording things, uh, especially audio. The one thing that we've shown time and time again is that when an officer is on duty, they have no expectation of privacy and you as a private citizen are allowed to record an officer's interactions without having to um, give that advisory. I mean, it should be implied that when your cell phone is out and you're recording an officer that you're doing both audio and video recording. Uh, and so, you know, it has been a, a good tool for people to have to hold us accountable from, from their perspective on their recording device. 
and I would say that our organization, not to say that this hasn't happened in the past in other organizations around the country, but our organization uh, does not make it a practice to seize uh, cell phones just because you recorded an officer doing his or her job. Uh, however, when I look at number nine and I think about, I think the, the where this potentially is going is understand that a cell phone is just a container of information. Uh, just like a briefcase or a suitcase or a car or in some cases a house. And depending on the circumstance and the exigency of the particular case, we do have the ability to seize the container and then write a warrant for the information that is contained therein uh, with, with, uh, with a judge's approval, uh, we're able to do that. Uh, think about times where uh, vehicles have been seized from people that may contain evidence of a crime. Uh, back in the day when meth labs were, pre were prevalent, we would seize a house and remove people from houses that had uh, evidence of methamphetamine labs and lock that down until we were able to write a warrant to be able to go in and deal with those things. So when you think about your cell phone as being a container of information, uh, and, and, what I'm, and what I'm thinking about is, for instance, if we had probable cause to believe that an individual was had um, you know, images of child pornography on their cell phone, that we would seize that cell phone, uh, and it could be under exigent circumstances, seize that cell phone and then write a warrant to get the information that's contained within the cell phone. So there isn't kind of an all or nothing type of discussion with this particular uh, number nine. Uh, and I think that um, there are some, there are some one-off situations where, um, taking of cell phones or recording devices without a person's consent does, does exist under exigency in the law to be able to do that under certain circumstances. You continue Travis, to say- I don't know if you have anything, anything more about that if you want. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Silverio? Yeah, well, so just the, the Chief was saying um, you can write a warrant, but that doesn't mean that the, or imply that the warrant was approved. And so I was considering the Supreme Court case that said that uh, cell phones are um, held under the Fourth Amendment. Well, the, the information in, within them. And so when you're talking about writing warrants, so we could be in a situation where the exigency of the circumstance means we have to preserve the container that is holding maybe the evidence that we need. And then we write a warrant to the judge to actually break into your cell phone, for lack of a better term, with our technology and retrieve the information we need. And it has to be narrowly focused. Now, if that warrant is denied, saying you don't have probable cause to get into this person's cell phone, then the need to keep the container no longer exists and we return the container back to the individual. So in some cases, the warrant's written specifically for a cell phone. Like for instance, we're doing a search warrant on a house. We wrote the search warrant to get into the house and what we're looking for in there is guns, ammo, electronic devices that may have those things. Then we seize that, but, in, but out in the field or in certain situations, if exigency occurs, uh, then we have the ability to, to kind of take that container and then the discretionary time to write the search warrant to get the information from within it. Thank you, Chief. But not so, the right to destroy it, is that correct? Correct, correct, yeah. That's your, per, that's your personal property. And so not the, not the right to destroy that. Uh, and in, and in, I, don't, I, I can't recall any case that, that there's ever been property that's purposefully been destroyed. I'm not saying we haven't made mistakes in the evidence room when we purged things, but uh, yeah, no, not purposefully at all. So if we said as a committee that it would be a right to uh, sue the police department if these items were taken or destroyed, that wouldn't be an issue. It already exists today. We have a risk, a very robust risk process that people, I, I sign off on these all the time where people uh, file risk claims to be remunerated for their property that was damaged or destroyed. So it's not technically suing them, but it is some, it is uh, uh, monetary reimbursement for those things. And that happens in the pro in a process that we have today for risk claim. I think, you know, the kind of the fault line or the differences here are um, the committee first brought this up thinking that 
um, it's not okay for a police officer to take uh, the phone away. Say I'm filming the police for whatever reason. It's not okay for the police officer to take my phone, you know, for no for no good reason. But chief, you brought up some uh, incidents incidences where uh, there there is a good reason. There is a reason for taking a cell phone or a recording device from a person without their consent. So. Um, you know, how do we move forward with this particular policy recommendation in a way that makes sense? Yeah, I want to quickly respond to that, if I may. Um, sure. You know, I think, I think in the last 20 years or so, right, like cell phones and other wireless electronic devices are, went from being something that a few of us had and now to being super vital communications tools that necessitate the full participation in, in life nowadays, especially right now in quarantine since we're all shut down. Our cell phones, our computers are, are essential. They're also really powerful tracking devices. And I think the biggest concern I have is around um, people's individual privacies and knowing where a person's phone is located reveals sensitive information um, and also what they have on it, pictures of their, of their loved ones. Um, you know, videos of, of important events. Uh, and right now, you know, EPD has the right to obtain personal information without ever getting a warrant from a, without ever getting a warrant. I mean, not, not, and not necessarily in our case, sorry, chief, but in other police departments, right, there, there has been cases of this happening. Um, I think what, what gives me pause, not necessarily situation, like you mentioned, right, chief, like if there's instances of someone engaging in um, really awful behavior and has content on their phone that's that's illegal, that certainly is something that we can deal with, right? It's certainly something that you would get a warrant for and you obtain that and, and, and you go from there. But I think in the name of, of trying to think about exigent circumstances, I'm wondering if we put a blanket that's too overarching, um, especially when it comes to you know, people's call records, contact lists, contents of our text messages, calls, right? How do we limit the scope of, of, of which how you could obtain information on a person's cell phone? And at the same time, right? Like if, if I'm recording something, if I'm recording someone in law enforcement, my phone gets taken away, um, who's to say what I have on my cell phone that would potentially hold out law enforcement, law enforcement official accountable isn't going to be taken, tampered with, and then I'm left with nothing. So I, I hear I hear your concerns, but I also hope you can appreciate some of mine. Sure, yeah, and and here's the here's the fundamental challenge we have is when we have these conversations is that you're speaking for the, the for the majority of situations we have is the lens by which you're looking through, and when I'm speaking is I'm speaking from the one off situations, you know, of of not wanting to do something policy wise that doesn't at least allow a little wiggle room for those one-off situations. I think one of the things that is maybe a misnomer about uh, seizing of a piece of information, uh, seizing of, of a container, and I'm just gonna call the phone the container because it just houses a bunch of information. Seizing the container, um, the officer has does not have any right to access information in that container without a warrant. And when the warrant is written, it has to be written so it's narrowly identifies the pieces of information the officer is looking for. So it's like your house. I can't seize. I can't do a search warrant on a house and say I'm. I'm going to write a search warrant. I think there's probable cause to believe X, Y, and Z, and I get to. I get to look for everything. For instance, a great example of this is, is if I'm going into a house and wrote a search warrant, say for illegal firearms, I can only search that residence where a firearm could reasonably be concealed. So that means going into your, into your bedroom and opening up your jewelry box is not, is, is not authorized. I mean, see what I'm saying? So when you think about a warrant that for information, that narrow scope is, um, is in the warrant. And, uh, and there's unfortunately a tremendous amount of trust that has to be extended that we're doing the right things for the right reasons. Uh, and electronics are completely different just in the sense of the, the, um, the technology it takes to actually see that because many, many of those are, are done without, without, uh, 
having the codes to open some of those things. So, yeah, I, I totally get where you're coming from, Joel. I think there's a way for us all to get to yes on this that gives us the ability to do things we need to do while still protecting people's rights to privacy and that that important piece of equipment, which I do agree with you, has just become a part of our lives, good, bad, or indifferent. It's we're we're all dependent on it. So, thank you, Chief. Um, this is an example of uh, some work that needs to be done between now and the next subcommittee meeting, right? Yeah. Um, so, Barrio, it looks like number 11 is the next one with a no in that column. Is that correct? That is correct. So, um, you know, I, I think that we definitely should press for this to be an option for people to um, have the right to remain anonymous and uh, when they're notified that they're being recorded, that they should be able to, to opt out of that footage. I know that there's some real gray areas here. I, I personally feel that any kind of body cam footage um, is, um, it's an interaction between a, a public enemy, a public entity, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that public entity and a private uh, person. And I, I think that um, just based on that alone, that we should have the right to, to just not have uh, recording of, of our interaction. So I, I would say that we should move to have that no become a yes. Notify subjects that they have the option to remain anonymous and stop recording or storing footage if they choose this option. Um, so Chief or Lieutenant Sam Miguel or Travis Smith, city prosecutor, thoughts or comments on that? Well, I, I can be, um, I'll be a, li a little brief. Um, people at this point, they have a constitutional right to just not say anything. Um, and so you can always exercise that ability to not interact in that, uh, in that capacity, I mean, what happens to you based on that, whether or not the officer has probable cause to do whatever it is they decide they want to do at that moment is up to them. Um, but I, I don't, uh, essentially what you're, you're telling an officer, if you ban, uh, if you give somebody the right to uh, revoke this, is you're, you're taking a very, very large tool that law enforcement has um, uh, to access this information. The video that's recorded, uh, you do have expectations of privacy uh, when that is released. Uh, it's controlled within EPD, but um, I, I think that that would be uh, really problematic from just a basic law enforcement standpoint, um, because this is, uh, this is what officers do is they engage in conversation with people being able to uh, record that, I think, is very, very helpful. Uh, and there, we've looked at a lot of the safeguards that we have in place to do it. But I understand why people feel that that recording is invasive. And that, that's the only real comment I have is you do have the ability just to kind of remove yourself from the situation. That's everybody's right. Travis, thank you. Other thoughts or comments? I have a few, but I'd like to give a chance to some of the participants to provide feedback. This thank, thank you, Joe. Don't take a lot of space. If no one Appreciate has anything, I have something. Okay, well, let's let's give it a moment uh, here. A little bit of awkward silence is always good, right? Anyone with thoughts or comments on number eleven? Okay, Joel. Beautiful. Oh, wait, could you quickly read off the comment from Sandra, Kevin? Yeah, I... sure. I'm just bringing it up now. Sandra says, I feel the only time a camera should be turned off uh, when on a call or interacting with someone should be if they say they do not want to be recorded for their privacy. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Um... Yeah, no, I, I just, uh, you know, this is, there's a reason why this was included as uh, Campaign Zero and 21st Century Policing. And I think given the, just what happened over the summer and this last, in, in 2020, 
some of these recommendations probably don't go far enough. And so I think uh, at minimum, right, like people have a right to privacy. And um, if folks don't want to be recorded by body cams, they, they shouldn't have to be. Um, at the same time, my part of my concern is, you know, who's to say a body cam gets turned off and then later it, it come, you know, when the question asks is gets asked, well, what happened? Why wasn't there any footage? You know, the story is that someone asked for it to be turned off. And then, right, the question is, did that actually happen or not? And if it did, if they did, well, then that's that's too bad, right? We missed out on some critical bit of information. If they didn't, that's also not good. So that's that's my only my only concern. Thank you, Joel. I think Sandra's comment is actually uh, resonating deeply with me around if we get to something that makes sense that it is deeply rooted in privacy. I think there's potentially a way that an officer can be interacting with somebody and somebody on camera can request the officer to turn that off and the officer can affirm with that person that that's exactly what's going to happen. And then you would have that recorded that that person's the one that required or asked for that to be turned off. So there is some of that. And I, and I, and I like the delineation between privacy and other things, because uh, can you imagine, you know, as, as a matter of, for instance, DUI enforcement, if every, every person driving under the influence of, of alcohol asked us to turn off our cameras, then, you know, uh, it, it flies in the face of the, of the evidence we're trying to gather, taking this dangerous driver off the road and, and, and do a successful prosecution. So uh, it's an intriguing thought about what that looks like with discretionary time in a privacy type of situation to, uh, to acknowledge that in the moment get the advisory from the person or their desire from the person and to be able to to meet that person's needs. Interesting. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Sandra. Other comments on number 11 before we move on to number 12. For me, I think that this is just a, a, a quick yes, we should definitely um, move to have number 12 available to the public and their families. Uh, storage time is not an issue for me. I, I do want to be considerate of, of lengthy storage times for videos, but if a family wants access, they can have that without, without having any issue for two years. I definitely feel that this is something that we should make a yes. All right, Silverio, um, let me sh make sure I'm understanding you completely. Uh, are you suggesting that we work on this to create a motion this evening? Or is this something that we're going to put in with the rest of our efforts uh, for the next meeting? Put in for the rest of our efforts to make a policy decision to move forward to the ad hoc committee. To okay, thank you. Those decisions. I'm a little slow sometimes, so thank you. All right, uh, any thoughts or comments on that number 12? This is allow citizens, or sorry, civilians to review footage of themselves or their relatives and request this be released to the public and stored for at least two years. Thoughts or comments? I would uh, mention just really quickly, and I, I think uh, Lieutenant Sam Miguel answered this way back at the beginning of this a little bit. There's a pretty robust process in place at the statutory level uh, in Oregon regarding what you can and can't uh, release. And so I think it would just be really important to make sure that the policy isn't running afoul of that because you can have a policy of saying X, Y, Z, but if there's an Oregon statute that says you don't get the um, that's going to be problematic. And so you want to make sure those marry up at least enough where you're not going to have issues in the future, uh, because there are going to be people in those body cams that are going to have expectations of privacy outside of those civilians that are requesting it, whether it be the, the individual who's directly being recorded or people behind them. Those people have an expectation of privacy, too, that we need to run through that process for a um, public information request. Um, and then um, 
just from a practice standpoint for me, and again, this is a very small subset of the cases, the cases that are actually being prosecuted, but when, when a case is being prosecuted uh, and I have it, until that case is resolved, um, the defendant has access to the body cam because obviously they are constitutionally required as part of the discovery process. But I, I in general, and I think most prosecutors you would ever talk to, uh, uh, don't want the information while an active criminal case is going out to just be released to the public for these releases. Um, we work with victims a lot to be able to have access to the body cam. Uh, but we don't generally just hand it out. There's some rare uh, exceptions, uh, traffic uh, collisions uh, where someone has a civil attorney and they're trying to essentially bring some sort of civil suit that we have to give it over required by law. But there, to have a blanket thing, I think could be uh, challenging. Thank you, I Travis. Con I considered going into law and I would not have been a prosecutor. I would have been a public defender. So, you know, not pulling any hard strings with me for that. But I definitely feel that, um, you know, here's, here's the delineation that I feel. Any kind of conversation that a public officer is having with a private citizen is something that should be available to the rest of the citizens in that community. Uh, now, I understand um, it kind of goes against my privacy concerns, but if something happens and there is footage that is available, I think that we should have an option to see um, what took place with that particular interaction. And if there's any uh, Oregon State issue that is, um, like you said, kind of crossing over on this particular uh, policy, then I'm going to blame Kaz and Kevin because they're the ones who set this up for us. Well, and well-placed blame, Silverio. <laughs> sure. All right, well, thank you. I just wanted to respond to that just very, very quickly. Um, so what, what I'm saying, you know, I'm holding on to that. I don't want it public. That's for that very short period of time while the case is being prosecuted. As soon as I am done with a case, uh, the, the, the record holder, if you will, or the release authority for that, uh, is, is solely through the city of Eugene, through the police department, and it's that normal records release process. Um, and again, as, as uh, someone articulated earlier, I think it was Lieutenant Sam Miguel, there are times where certain things are required to be released uh, because of the public interest. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's not like when a case comes into my office, uh, we, we take that video, hold on to it, and never let it go. It's just for that very short window while we're prosecuting it. Uh, we try to try to minimize the amount of people that have that video. Uh, sometimes people can view it and they end up on the jury theoretically, right? So you don't want to have that situation where someone has had access to the evidence and, and formed opinions and, and done things before they walk in that jury room because you want that jury to be uh, to have that process. That's a sacrosanct process and we want to make sure that it's done properly. So thank you, Travis. Any other thoughts, comments on number 12? I think Abraham has, has his hand raised. Oh, thanks, Ems. I, I'm unable to see everyone. Um, Abraham, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Ems. Um, I just want to bring a different perspective. You know, um, if you have someone like me, an immigrant, uh, English as a seventh language, uh, um, not knowing if what is the system here and how the system works, um, what should you trust and who not to, because where you're coming from, maybe you, you know, law enforcement is something you were running away from. <laughs> I think um, giving that opportunity for pe people, you know, to report and trust the cops on uh, the police on the footage, what's going to be on the video is very important. Because sometimes um, with audio or not, um, people at the moment when they are going through 
you know, um, something and they needed the police or the cops are there, either they wanted it or not, it's the, the, the emotion, the emotions are high and people cannot express themselves. And the cops, the police officer is supposed to be the, the well-trained person on the field. It's supposed to be the, the person I trust the most. I'll take an example. If I, um, when I got here uh, in Eugene, I went to the tailors. I think the bar is closed now. Went to the tailors. And the, for the first time, someone called me the N word. And, and unlike a lot of people around me, um, my first reaction was call the, call, call the police. Because where I came from, the police used to stand up for people like me. I was, you know, I, I wanted to call the, the, the cops. I wanted to call the police. And I, I, around me, there was like, you know, some people saying, you know, let, let us deal with this guy. He's drunk and whatever. I didn't want no, nothing to do with him. I, I just wanted the police to come and protect me. And every single day, I think about that. I think about me being here or not. I think about the police protecting my daughter. I think about the police believing, trusting my daughter when she feels scared and call the cops. For heaven's sake, I, I think that we can put together something that will make me feel good that when my daughter called the days she would be in need of the police, regardless of me being here or not, she is going to be supported by the police. And I understand that, you know, Chief Skinner multiple times told me, you know, they, he is looking to hire the best police officers ever. He wants that to happen. He, he is looking at how he can improve things. But I think we have an opportunity here to help him. I am a union leader, by the way. I am the president of the African American Caucus of SCIU statewide and the secretary West Coast. We Ibrahim, I, I, I hate to do this to you, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of a time check. One minute, I'm gonna be done. Okay. We don't have that person that doesn't align with our goal of the, the, the you know the 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 the, the, the um, vision and everything from the agency. But we have difficulties because of the laws and rules and whatever everything else. We have the opportunity to give the police union and to give to Chief Skinner to weed out those bad officers. We have to help them. We're not helping. We, we have to help Chief Skinner. We have to help the police union to get rid of the people that we think are not serving the community. How can we do that? Let's keep them accountable. Good policies make union is there to enforce the, the contract, the, the collective bargaining uh, agreement, but management had to put forward policies to make this the, 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 the entire department work for the community and something smooth to run. Ibrahim, and thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm not, I wasn't supposed to be here to begin with. So thank you for allowing me to be here and I really appreciate it. Ibrahim, we appreciate that you were here. I hated to cut you off, man, but um, we're running out of time. So forgive me. Thank you. All right, uh, appreciate those comments. Uh, Silverio? I, um, yeah, I did want to jump to 14 if we could really quickly before. We yeah, you've got it, man. All right, let's go to 14. the hill that I die on. Thanks, Silver. <laughs> so 
FOIA. <laughs> I don't think anything should be uh, exempt from FOIA. And I think this is something that we need to find a yes on. And again, I'm going to blame Kaz and Kevin if that's something that is it says governed by state level public records law. And my assumption is I like Oregon for this reason. Um, state public records law also says that FOIA should not be exempt. That's my assumption. Well, that's a question for uh, perhaps the city prosecutor. Well, I, I, I think Lieutenant Sam McGill mentioned this a little bit earlier too. There's, there's a special section and I don't handle the civilian side, uh, only the criminal side for body cam stuff. So I'm hesitant to give you a real thorough answer because I'm, I'm outside of my scope of expertise and the, the city attorney's office probably would be much better at really explaining that whole thing, but the super short version is um, there are freedom of uh, public information requests process uh, are differentiated between whether or not they're body cam or not. There's specific statutory language uh, just for body cam. And so that's sort of the hurdle that you have to have to get over is how do you craft a policy that addresses that sp particular limitations uh, that the state of Oregon has for for body cam because it is is a there's different requirements and there's different exceptions for that kind of material as opposed to anything else that you would normally ask for. On that, we had Patty Perlo with us the other day, and she said that the body cam footage was uh, not public; that it was a private. Um, that anything that the EPD has is private and it's not considered public. Is that correct? I would say that's a, a super short version of it. Yes, again, there are some exceptions where for public, uh, there's, a, there's sort of a, this very clear public need to be able to access the video. But again, the, the state of Oregon currently, right now, doesn't look at body cams as something that is a sort of a generic public record that someone can ask. Uh, but again, if you want like a very particular nuanced, what are the specific requirements? What are the specific rules? I would refer you to the city attorney's office because they deal with this relatively frequently. Well, how, how about those like ice cream cart looking things that have cell towers at the top? Are those public? So if you Google search House Bill 2571, that's the bill the legislature passed, I think it was about 2016, that really identifies the law around body-worn camera footage and who can release it, how long we have to hold it, all of those things. So I put it in the chat, and I hope it went to everybody and not just the last person that said something. I think it might have gone to the last person who said something, Lieutenant. I don't see it. Okay, well, it's House Bill 2571. Oregon House Bill 2571, thank you. Um, all right, here's Mr. Timekeeper stepping in. We have five minutes. Uh, we're not gonna get through this entire list. That's okay. Uh, we have a request from EMS to have a discussion about number 17 uh, here, which is a little bit down on the list. Um, before we do that, I wanna ask, are we ready to move on from um, number 13. Yeah, that sounds good. And if we can, we have five minutes. I'd like to review the one before it as well. Okay. Uh, so when we will get to 17 and then we'll take a look at 16. Yep. All right. Ems? Uh, have, yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to uh, hear more about if there's any reasons why, or specific reasons why um, officers are allowed to uh, view the recordings and what will be the negative effects of them not being able to view them. So I think for me personally, the main reason to have an officer view their video it, before they write their report is so they get all the quotes right, they get all the statements right. We don't want them to misspeak and think they remember hearing something and put in their report that they heard X, Y, and Z when they act, it was actually slight 
a slight variation of that. We want them to be really able to articulate what was said exactly in the report. I think that's the biggest issue. Yeah, I would agree with that, Angie. You know, remember when you and I started, I don't know if you guys, you guys obviously didn't know this. Angie and I went to police academy together. We're actually finishing our 30, year, 30 years together. And when we started as baby cops, remember we, we used to try to write down everything that somebody said in our notebook. And everything we observed, every nuance to the detail, the best we could, we'd write it down in our notebook. And at the end of the night, we'd sit down with our notebooks, open them back up and try to capture a report or write the most accurate report we possibly could based on those notes. And here in Eugene, when you have an officer like on a Friday or Saturday night that might have as many as eight or 10 or 12 different incidents he or she has gone to, trying to keep those things straight is really, really difficult. And ultimately for me as a, as a police chief is I want the written instrument that comes from an incident an officer was involved in, I want it to be as accurate as it possibly can. And so just to echo some things that Angie said is that that's, that's really at the heart of, of allowing them to, to see body cam uh, before a writing a report. And I'm not sure all of them avail themselves of that. Uh, I'm not sure that happens uh, or how frequently that happens, uh, but it is an option right now. Thank you, Chief. Um, I just noticed I uh, blinked and it was 8.01. Um, I'm going to ask permission because Joel asked if we could have a quick conversation about number 16. Pardon and then if I've... we have a 10 minutes added to the meeting. No more. Okay. So uh, 10 minutes. Can we go to 8.10? Seems to be uh, standard practice for us to do that. Um, if you have to go. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, if you can stay until 8.10, let's do it. Joel? Yeah, can we hit uh, 13 actually? 13, all right. Require body and dash cam footage to be stored externally and ensure district attorneys and civilian oversight structures have direct access to the footage. The note is that it's partially enacted. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is something I was thinking about. And um, I think part of my concern with this is that, you know, it's great that it's at least partially enacted, but really when we talk about body cam footage, there's a couple of concerns when it comes to it, right? It's, it's one, it's how is it stored, right? Who has that information? Two, what's the chain of custody? Um, and then finally, right, like who's, who has access to the footage? Those are the three big things when it comes to it, uh, when it comes to body cam footage. And so right now I see the DA has access, the PA can request it, but it's not stored in an external place. And jogging my memory from when my brief stint on the police commission if i recall that that the the cloud is currently stored on internal service servers with an epd is that correct yeah so we're trying to get away from that i think what you'll see is a is a huge push by the city uh, in general to move to a cloud-based environment the on-premise solution of servers uh uh and storing footage uh, locally is, is starting to become an outdated practice and, and cloud is, cloud uh, storage, especially in the Microsoft government cloud, uh, which is CGIS compliant. Uh, and that's the other thing we have to take, making sure that it is CGIS compliant so uh, is probably Chief, the just, way we're going to go. Could you explain the acronym? Uh, criminal justice information system. So anything that's storing information that has people's identities, birth dates, social security numbers, uh, maybe convictions, those kinds of things are not a matter of public record. Um, and those have to be, um, and those can only be accessed by CGIS compliant individuals and CGIS compliant uh, agencies and only stored on CGIS compliant cloud-based servers. So that's the direction where we want to go is that cloud environment. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't have access to the data. Even if it's stored in cloud, we would have access. So I can have Angie talk about kind of who has access and who can get in there and how we can lock things down when we need to. So evidence.com actually is cloud-based. It is not solely held on our servers. It is cloud-based and it's with the CGIS compliant um, servers, but they're not our, ours. And once the fit, video, video footage is uploaded, the only people who can um, access it are the involved officer, some of our detectives for investigative purposes or supervisors. And then the only people who can 
um, redact it or anything like that are our forensic evidence, evidence control people. So it's pretty limited, but it so, is stored cloud-based. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the biggest piece for me is just the civilian oversight structures, right? Like, is there is there a mechanism for them to have access to? Yeah, so. Yeah, they get it. Yeah, the auditor's office gets all the body cam footage. They have access to that. Yeah, they Do we have, have to send evidence. it to them? Do we yeah, have to send have it to them, though, Ange? Yeah, they have an evidence.com platform, just like the district attorney's office yeah. does. And um, they request access to the video, and we share all video associated with the case, any case that they request. Does the Civilian Review Board have access to, to this, or just the auditor's office? Yes, the civilian review, the auditor's office provides sure. it to the civilian yeah, yeah. Board board. when they're reviewing yeah. cases. Sure. Okay. I think, I think, I, I think I, we can probably figure this off online, but I'm just curious about this, this portion I'm partially enacted. What is the, the portion that's, isn't making it uh, the full why? Yeah, good question, Joel. Um, and I will ask uh, Cindy Coleman about that and get that answer. Right. And at the end of the day, right, it's like, I mean, I, I know the other thing too, even with cloud-based servers, right, there was a massive government like hack that happened recently um, and it's impacted folks all across the nation. Um, if you can hear eWeb, right? My, my uh, yeah, no, I know some folks at eWeb are dealing with it and some other folks in government agencies. So there is that definitely that concern around cloud-based servers and how secure they are. But even at the end of the day, right, like if we have, this footage, it, it should be accessible to to variety of folks, not just law enforcement agencies and the DA, but also these civilian uh, review boards and, and oversight committees. So I think that's that's my only concern is how to we'll make sure that that turns into a full why. Yeah, I think I think maybe where where that partially enacted piece is is around that comment that says civilian oversight because when we think about our structure, that's auditor's office, CRB, and police commission would be considered part of civilian oversight. So I'm wondering if it says partially enacted because not necessarily all those entities have. The other piece of that that's interesting is direct access, which would, which would in my mind mean that they have the ability at their discretion to be able to get into our system or get into the data and look at whatever they wanna look at. And so I think there's a way to get to the yes on this that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Folks, we are at the end of our extra 10 minutes. And so I'm going to uh, propose a way to move forward. And that will be, I will connect, uh, I will email the subcommittee tomorrow and I will list all of the um, policies that we've discussed tonight, plus the ones we didn't quite get to and ask that you um, volunteer uh, to work on crafting a motion between now and when we meet again for the second time. Um, of course, any one of you individually has the right and the privilege to work by yourself, but um, I would suggest to kind of tap into the wisdom of the group and probably team up on some of these. So be prepared, keep a lookout for an email from me tomorrow uh, with that opportunity for you to kind of sign up uh, on one or more of these policies. Uh, I and uh, myself and Kaz will act as the facilitators to communicate with the uh, EPD folks and perhaps Travis uh, in the city prosecutor's office. And so just be aware of that. Um, I am always grateful for your uh, willingness to participate in this important process, taking time out of your evenings to do this. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. I wanna thank the subcommittee members. Hey, Ibrahim, Thanks for joining us. Uh, that was pretty awesome. Thanks to our folks thanks from EPD. Thanks for EP having me. <laughs> Always. Uh, thanks to Chief Skinner, Lieutenant Sam Miguel, and Travis Smith. Much, much appreciated. Be well, everyone. Stay healthy. I have one healthy. quick question for of Chief. Of course. Um, was the guy that made the mouth sounds at your police academy? I did Say it myself. <laughs> you and Lieutenant Miguel would know, right? <laughs> you guys remember those old hey, movies? Do not bribe her for stories about me from Police Academy. That was 30 years ago. There's yeah, I think the movie was 40, so. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Sounds like there's a story there to be told. We'll look forward to that. 
All right, folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.